All right, so we'll begin the panel discussion shortly uh, once we have all our speakers here. Uh, thank you all once again for a very insightful talks this morning and uh, welcome back for the panel discussion. This is a short 30 minute panel where we'll address uh, any pending questions that came up during the talks, uh, but also any other new questions or sort of open thoughts and discussions that we might like to have. So maybe we'll start with uh, some of the questions that are already up on Slido. Uh, some of them seem fairly specific, but maybe related to uh, things that came up in the talks. So the first is, uh, can we train a machine learning model for current hydrological observations? We don't have future observations. How can we use the trained model to predict the future? Uh, this is sort of tangential to the topics that we covered today, but maybe broadening that question uh, to the speakers, given that we have limited observations, how do we train our models to be predictive for future climates? Anyone want to jump in on that? <laughs> okay, sure. Um... I got a nudge in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, my, so my two cents, I would, uh, I think the a logical way to start is like um, the, the observed sample size is really challenging to deal with. So why not start in a synthetic environment with a climate model um, where you have the luxury of the, making the data unlimited virtually and then see if you can train emulators of um, physics we're interested in, like the rainfall relationship to mean climate and uh, and see what it takes to to get that to extrapolate to future unseen climates. Um, and I think there's glimmers of, of ways that you can do that already emerging. If you normalize the input vectors intelligently and the output vectors normalized by physical quantities that have obese constraints across climates, um, there might be a shot at doing that. And then in the synthetic world, you can back off the luxurious data volumes to see if any of that's possible in the end with a smaller sample size. That's how I, I'm inclined to approach that kind of thing. Yeah, I would, I would just add the only chance you have is to start out with the climate models that project out and train on that. But that's pretty much all you can do, I think. Thank you. Uh, all right, so moving on to the next question, which is also fairly general, uh, maybe not directly related to the topics covered today, but how do, how do we differentiate between parametric and non-parametric machine learning algorithms? And can you give us some examples? I think in the chat, I was nudged to answer that one, but I'm not, I'm not sure what they're looking for because the models are all, all of them have parameters and hyperparameters. So I'm not sure how to differentiate the non-parametric ones because I think everything we've talked about has been parametric. So if, if, has anybody else got an answer that's non-parametric? No, okay. So my answer to that is we haven't talked about any of the non-parametric ones. So the examples for parametric, everything we've done. Fair enough. All right, uh, we, we do have some unsupervised learning talks tomorrow, so maybe we can uh, pivot that question to some of the I would tomorrow. argue that even non-supervised still has parameters. I argue sure. that when I teach it in class, that non-supervised learning, they call it unsupervised, but there's still something you're giving it in knowledge. You know, to take right. clustering is the most basic example. You tend to tell it, I want three clusters, or I want, you know, this many groupings, or here's my distance function. It's still something. Thank you. Yep. Uh, all right. So there's, there's one on the top. Uh, can novelty detection be used to determine the significance of a distinct pattern against a pre-existing example? For example, an extreme event under climate change. Gonna guess that one's mine too, because I was the one who talked about novelty detection. Um, and I think so. Um, what we've found in the novelty detection is that it's pretty interesting, but it's also pretty hard to get working exactly correctly. So I would say yes, and I would also throw that one a little bit to Emma and talk about the LRPs because they think the LRPs 
are a, not, while not the same method as novelty detection, they are very similar in some sense, and they can try to also be used to determine the significance of, of those patterns. I would just say, I, I agree with you there, Amy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, so the next one's how do you use the heat maps or attribution maps for non-image data? For example, high multi-dimensional data that's not from an image. Okay, I'll take that one. Um, so first of all, again, keep in mind, it tells you the relevance of the different input neurons. So as long as you are able to normalize the high, highly multidimensional data in a meaningful way, if you apply something like LRP, you should still be able to find out what the most relevant pieces of information are in your input, regardless of whether they represent pixels or something else, because the neural network doesn't even know it's pixels. The neural networks just get signals at the input and what, where they're coming from, whether they're from an image or whether that's other variables that you have in there, it doesn't even know. But the key point is the one trick to remember is that you have to you have to be able to normalize the variables in a meaningful way. And if they're all not Gaussian variables, while well, you, you, know, you subtract the mean and you divide by the standard deviation and you are good. But if some of them are exponential and some are Gaussian, then it starts to become tricky and you have to wonder whether your results are as meaningful. So that's, that's maybe a little bit of an open question still, the normalization. But other than that, it really doesn't matter whether you have an image format or something else. Thank you. Uh, the next ones, uh, aside from hyperparameter tuning, could any of the interpretability techniques we heard about today be used to help diagnose why some emulators lead to crashes? I, yeah, I, this would be fun to collaborate on. <laughs> I was just going to say the first half of the question goes to Amy and me, and the second half goes to Mike. So, Mike, let's just right. collaborate more. Yeah, I, I think the answer to that is yes, and let's talk. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Excellent idea. I, I think we've just only begun to scrutinize these neural network emulators. Like a few have been trained that behave okay, and, and intercomparison is the next step. And I think I, I totally receive the message you were transmitting, Amy, that 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 should use as many possible techniques as possible to find things that are robust across methods and uh, that would be fun to do but it's time consuming and um, yeah it seems like really important right and I think the same person asked a question down at the bottom that says can we see ways that ML interpretability help with some of the issues that Mike encounters and I think th those two questions go together and I think that the answer is yes and we're just gonna have to work together thank you uh, the next one's how do you make sure inputs are staying in sample when simulating future climates? So this is something that Tom Buchler and our group is working hard on and he has a recorded AMS presentation that explains it more if you'd like to get details. But a short answer is that you have a choice about how you formulate the input variables. We chose arbitrarily the same ones that the climate model feeds to a convection parameterization, the specific humidity in units of kilograms per kilogram and the temperature. Specific humidity is not climate invariant due to water vapor feedbacks. Well, Clausius Clapeyron will increase um, at 7% per Kelvin. And so you're guaranteed to take yourself out of sample if your input moisture variable is specific humidity. But you could choose for it to be relative humidity, which we know is sort of climate invariant. So that's one way to just massage the input vector in a way that converts an extrapolation problem into an interpolation problem. And uh, Tom's talk at AMS shows that a lot of the biggest errors um, that, that you see when you try to get these neural network trained on the present climate to extrapolate to the future can be beaten down with simple tricks like that. You, have to, you also have to do it on the output vectors. So um, normalizing, say, the, uh, the convective heating's vertical integral by the latent heat flux, um, taking into account the idea that you can only flux as much enthalpy vertically as there was uh, at the surface. These sorts of tricks. Cool, thank you. Uh, the next ones, can you elaborate why the simulated MJO shows shorter period in days from SPCAM and NNCAM? No, um, I actually hadn't noticed that in the spectrum, so I'll have to go back and look at the uh, Miller Colatus diagram. To me, it looked like the same spectral feature, but I, I haven't taken a close look. Um, here, I could speculate. Um, it did look like the mean state in the neural network model 
created a sharper ITCZ. Um, and so for those who ascribe to the moisture mode theory of the MJO, the sharpness of the vapor gradient can affect the speed at which vorticity anomalies affect the whole disturbance to these. So that's waving my hands, but uh, I don't really know. All right, thank you. I guess the next one uh, is for Amy. Oops. It disappeared. Uh, I was willing to answer it. What happened to it? Uh, <laughs> uh, I will answer it anyway because I read it. I can say it out yeah. loud. It was Great. there. It was, I just it must have been checked off. Um, the question was, could we use the models that we're using for hail to do airline turbulence prediction? And the reason I volunteered to answer that, there it is, it's back, is is the answer to that is yes. And in fact, we have a paper on that. Um, David Gagne is a co-author on that paper. Um, we and, and there was prior work at NCAR also using the diecast algorithm, which uh, Sue talked about. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of work showing that machine learning can be used to improve prediction of, H of turbulence. Um, and the, it, it, I, would, I would say this is both good news and bad news. The good news is there's a great, great uh, body of literature on that. The bad news is that the FAA uh, cut the funding before it managed to get into the uh, operational system. But hopefully someday that can get into the next gen system. Great. Thank you. Uh, some very nice comments. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Why do you think making machine learning more transparent has received comparatively less attention? I would love to take that one. Go for it. I'll give you an answer after. <laughs> okay. I thought you would. I, the first thing I would say is it's hard work. I mean, it's not like you just throw it in a machine and something comes out and you can use some automatic algorithm. It's a lot of hard work. It's a game. You sit together, your earth scientists and your data scientists sit down together and think, what should we be testing for? How are we going to look at this? How do we set up experiments? You go through lots of samples and then you come up with an explanation. It takes a lot of time. It's much easier to just, you know, throw things into your neural network, come up with nice results, make some summary plots, write your paper done, right? It, it, it takes time and effort. So I think that's one of the reasons. Amy? Uh, the other reason I was going to give is that at least when machine learning, I mean, I've been doing machine learning for 25 years. When, when machine learning was, you know, just starting to be applied to meteorology, it's just, it was enough to show that you could do something cool and you could do something well. But it's now that we're demonstrating that machine learning actually has real power, people want to understand really deeply what's going on inside the models. So I think in the beginning it was, here's this thing, can it actually work? And now that they're seeing that it works, they really want to understand how it works. And, and, and it goes, ties in with what Emma said. If, if it had been easy from the beginning to do the interpretation, people would have done it from the beginning, but it's hard. All right. Uh, this one's probably for Mike. Can you elaborate on what you mean by offline skill? I'd like to thank the other panelists for their last answer too. I feel less bad about not having been able to do any of that yet. Uh, <laughs> It's uh, so cool. Um, offline skill, yeah. So um, in a climate model, you know, there's a there's an interaction between the the planetary scale dynamics and the parameterized physics, and it's that interaction that leads the climate model to an equilibrium state about which all of its waves happen. Um, so um, there's a two stage process when we train an emulator to replace the convection parameterization. We first measure the behavior of the convection parameterization in its native environment when it's coupled to a climate model. Uh, and uh, we try to like create a big data set of all those interactions and then divide the data set up into uh, two portions, one to train on and one to test on. And that's the offline skill, how well we do at reproducing the convection parameterization's behavior when it's given the typical climate model inputs that it's used to experiencing. Now, what we mean by online skill is you take that emulator and put it inside the climate model and let it interact with the planetary dynamics. And that coupling can actually drive the coupled system to a totally different mean state and produce totally different sorts of variability. And so it's a much um, richer test and a different sort of test. Um, I hope that clarifies. There, there have been some questions about whether the offline skill, which is what you, you tune your hyperparameters against, is actually predictive of the online skill. Um, there's a bit of a debate happening right now about that. Great, thank you. Uh, the next ones, can you elaborate more on how to perform the neural network emulator? It is done either for a grid point or for each global grid point. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll let you interpret that and answer it. 
I think the question is whether it's local in space and time, and the answer is yes. So the same neural network, the same sets of weights and biases can be used for any geographic location on the planet. You can provide the temperature and moisture profile as the input, and it's only ever one location's input that are fed into the front of this emulator. And then what happens is it, it processes it and out comes the convective heating and moistening for that location. But we don't use different emulators for different locations and we don't feed in multiple grid points to the neural network to do any of the predictions so far. All right, so maybe we'll take the one right on top, clarifying the statistical testing on the maps. If the three sanity, sanity check methods are significantly different, then you don't have confidence in the original map. No, you're comparing them to the, you're comparing the sanity check methods to the original map, not to each other, or maybe I'm misunderstanding the way the question is written, um, but you're trying to have, what you're trying to do is if they are lots, if maybe it disappeared, but if they are very statistically different from the original map, then yes, you don't have confidence in the original, you, I think I said that backwards. If they're statistically different, you actually have confidence in the original map. That's what I'm trying to say. Because it means that the random one, if you trained a model on random labels and it generates something that's not statistically different from your, your thing that's trained on good labels, then, then, then you don't have confidence. I think I said that backwards when I tried to answer it the first time. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, I posted this question, but it relates to things that have come up in all three talks. So uh, how important do you think interoperability and explainability of these methods are versus accuracy and performance? I assume you want all three of us to answer. So do you just want us to go in order? Sure. I'll, I'll go first since I unmuted. Um, I think that they are going to be critically important because as machine learning is getting used more and more, uh, the trust in the machine learning model becomes much more important and the interpretation and explainability of the methods are going to be key for convincing others that it's actually a trustworthy method. No matter which method you choose out of all the methods we talked about, model interpretation and, and visualization, you have to be able to trust that the model is going to work in all situations. Or if you know the model is not going to work in some situation, then you can just throw it out the window like they already do with numerical models for certain situations. They say, oh, it's out to lunch for that, right? So you, you have to have this interpretability and explainability as we go forward because it's, it's needed to make, to, to understand when they work and why they work and how they work. All right, I'll go second. Um, I agree with everything that Amy said. Uh, in addition, I would just say, again, it depends totally on the application. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why you don't see AI tools used as much in earth science and operation yet because the trust isn't there and it's so crucial to get it right. I love to give the example again of Netflix movie recommendations. If you get it wrong, who cares? You know, one wrong movie recommendation, nobody cares. So there's really not much need for interpret interpretability and explainability if you come up with Netflix movie recommendations. But if you plan an evacuation route, you really wanna be sure that your neural network is doing it right and nobody may use it in operation until you can convince them what the thing is doing and that it's gonna perform well even on examples that it hasn't seen before. So, you know, I think the more we go into operation, the more important it becomes to have interpretability and explainability and basically trustworthy AI. I think you don't have trustworthy AI if you can't understand what the thing is doing. It's my take. Mike? Yeah, a, a year ago, I might have been uh, more of an outlier in my response and cavalier about this. Um, um, I might have said that, um, Hey, if you can if you can just show me an emulator that passes all my physical credibility tests, then I can think of lots of really cool scientific applications that I couldn't do without an emulator. <laughs> you know, explore paleoclimate with explicit convection for the first time because I can finally run 500-year simulations. And uh, you know, it's my job to build the credibility tests and stress tests of the machine that would be sufficient to convince me that's an okay application. But um, but nowadays, uh, since I'm realizing that these uh, actual performance uh, AI, like configurations of neural networks are so rare and hard to find, I think it, they're completely entangled topics. I think you can't uh, interpret uh, the stability issues without these techniques. And um, I think they're, I agree that they're mission critical. Um, and, uh, and you know, that's just the half of the scientist in me that wants to just do simulations we couldn't do otherwise and learn from those. 
but there's another half of me that's grown out of this whole engineering business that's saying, hey, the emulators themselves are totally worth interpreting to understand what they're doing because I mean, they're, they are a parameterization of convection that works better than any we've had. So if we can just interpret them, maybe we'll learn updates to our cartoon models. Um, so yeah, I think it is very important, I agree. Can I, can I add one more thought just in there? You know, the, the one thing I, were, I would say though, going, going maybe one step back from what I'm saying is, you know, we often wonder climate models, how transparent are they really? I mean, they've become so complex. I mean, we're modeling plankton now. We have all these, these equations that are physically perfectly clear, but because in numeric equations, you can't see the big picture behavior until you actually run the model and get the output. So I guess um, to also say we shouldn't be too critical towards the machine learning methods if we aren't more critical about our climate models either. So it's just, you know, keep it balanced, right? Do what you can, um, but not being unreasonable either. So just wanted to throw that thought that I think that climate models, while we understand the equations underlying them, just take a neural networks, you know, all the equations, you have all the forward propagation, every single step, it's just a combination of all these different layers together is so complex that we have a hard time understanding it as a thing. And the same thing is true for climate models. So maybe there's something we could do about climate models too. Thank you, some great insights there. Uh, I'm gonna skip the one on top, but I think this might have been, well, if anyone has any strong feelings, you can tell me, but uh, are there any land process emulators uh, using neural networks on the way? Are you aware of any? Um, I think it's a much harder problem. We don't know the equations we'd like to solve for the coupled mess of underground biogeochemistry, fungi, and plants to model feedbacks. Um, and so the idea of building luxurious synthetic databases, your training library is unapproachable. So you're, you're automatically stuck with a smaller sample size. But I am aware of cool ways to, to use machine learning to bypass traditional Mononobokov theory that are based on flux tower constraints. They're sparse, but really interesting. Um, and in our world, I guess all I could say is that we don't, we, we only know a little bit so far about whether you can emulate everything that a modern land model would require from the atmosphere um, satisfyingly for the feedbacks between the atmosphere and the land to play out okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, the next one from Zane is Does LRP work well for very deep networks? Do the layer wise propagation signals ever grow too small to be meaningful? Right, that one is clearly for me, and I have a twofold answer. So, number one, um, yes, the LRP is an approximation. And so, if you have lots and lots and lots of layers, I would expect the approximation to get worse. So, yeah, if it's very deep, one problem might be that the LRP approximation just isn't very good anymore. And the second issue that I will mention there is if a neural network is very deep, it's likely to also have skip layers, right? I mean, it's often like something like a rest net or something if it's really deep, because otherwise it doesn't work very well. And once you have skip layers, you, with the current implementations, you can't use LRP. Now there is an LRP version in development right now that hasn't been released yet that can do skip layers, but with the current ones, you can't do skip layers. So you, you know, without skip layers, you can't really have very deep neural networks anyway for analysis. So I hope that answers that one. Great, thank you. Uh, the next one's from Hamid. Are you aware of any examples that use machine learning in the earth sciences that have resulted in new discoveries? Maybe I jump onto this one. I mean, it depends on how exactly you define new discoveries, but I would point you toward Libby Barnes's newest paper that is on the archive. And I existed as one of the three papers on um, in my talk. So she's looking, for example, specific patterns of climate change that inform us that, that climate change is happening. And you can really find mechanisms there that are really interesting. It's like, oh, why, why do we suddenly, why is this area in China so important? And yes, most of it you can probably confirm with, with existing knowledge, but I bet that there are going to be a few pieces of new information in there. So I would encourage you to look at the Libby Barnes paper from 2020 that's on archive. Thank you. Did you have something to add? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I did. I did. I think that's a really, a really good question. Like, 
Um, I think there's some places where there's been really provocative results from, from learning that's sh shaken a community, or at least I get that impression from the afar sometimes. I see like a Google AI person talk about medicine and discovering like signatures of, of gender hiding in retinal imagery data that no, nothing in the medical literature suggested should exist and keep waiting for an analogy in our field that might be like that. But I think we're, um, I, I, you know, right now I feel like it's early days and like a good way to rephrase the question is like, what are the figures and diagnostics that I couldn't imagine another way of ever making that, um, that might be poised to lead to some new insight? And I think the, the asking neural networks about the year and, and applying LRP on them is, is one of those. And I think um, there's unsupervised examples emerging, like chief physical, uh, Micah Sonnevald has this beautiful study where they take like really high dimensional eco uh, ocean ecosystem data and perform clustering that outperforms k-means and you can see these structured geophysical boundaries that you you know are opening up new questions about why do these boundaries exist between ecosystems and what sets their shape um and for me the the big, the animation is that equivalent of the linear response function of convection that's more generalized that shows you how the relationship changes seamlessly with latitude um but those are just pictures and images right now that we couldn't have made otherwise. I don't, I can't say that there's some fundamental discovery that's emerged from them yet. Um, um, but I think it's a really cool question to have in the front of your mind. Thank you. Well, th there was an interesting question that uh, got bumped up, but let, let's discuss it anyway. Uh, it was on, um, how do we overcome the un unwillingness of uh, old school thought in adopting AI in the art sciences? I think we all in the chat are having a discussion that we all want to answer it. So I'll give an answer and then we'll go on. Um, I, I think that one's really interesting, even though, yes, even though you say you want to skip it, Mostafa, I, I, we want to talk about it because it's really, really important because especially as you go down to the, to the people who are at the front lines, there's a lot of resistance to adapting and using the AI methods because they've always done it one way. And because something is very, very different for some of those frontline forecasters from other traditional AI methods. And I'm gonna withdraw, um, not say medical on this one, but forecasters are making life and death decisions and they're making them very, very quickly. And they need to be able to trust what they're doing and to know that it's working. And so part of the overcoming and the unwillingness is to demonstrate over and over and over again that the AI is trustworthy. And we have to do that repeatedly because if you ask the forecaster how they're going to trust somebody else's forecast, it's because they've had a history of being trustworthy. We have to make that history for AI to show that it's trustworthy over and over and over again so that they believe it. And I'll let somebody else take an take a answer too. Maybe I'll go second. Yeah, I have similar thoughts. So number one is, you know, you just show how well they work and that can often pe convince people. If you're in academia, so when I try to establish new collaborations with people, the key is often to find a student who's interested to go through the grad student. And as I see that very often that the grad student picks up a topic and says, oh, machine learning works so well, I want to try it. And then the writer is like, well, I don't know about that, but give it a try for a month or two. And then they come back with good results and suddenly that writer becomes all curious and gets into machine learning too. And that's how another lab gets converted. So, and then the third one is, of course, the more trustworthy you can make it, the more you can explain to people, yes, we also care about how they work. We don't want to just treat it like a black box. We also want to know from a meteorological perspective how this neural network is, is working. That also really increases trust. If, you know, I think the more you work really closely with people and you make clear that you're not just a computer scientist who just cares about the numbers, but you actually care about the application, it establishes trust with the, with the collaborators and takes you very far. But it's ultimately collaborations that bring people on board, I think, my take. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, this is a really interesting question, an important one I agree to. Um, I think um, some strategies that I find helpful are just finding common ground. It's really often a very healthy urge to be skeptical of any new statistical fad. And then basing it, you know, sharing, sharing as a scientist, that same skepticism is, is helpful. Um, and just focusing on the actual demonstrable advantages of the technology, you know, like, sure, it's just a high dimensional nonlinear regressor that's okay at interpolation, but it turns out that's actually a really powerful thing. Um, and uh, even for deep neural networks. And, um, and then 
talking about the factors that mean it's not a fad and why it's not a coincidence that this is happening now in terms of the, the joint revolution in the algorithms and the hardware entangled with the algorithms um, and the order of magnitude change and the amount of empirical data uh, fitting that we can do. Um, yeah, but the this, this came up when in our five hour working group about whether there's a gap in training um, that like whether like established senior faculty ought to be encouraged to engage or have a friendly course designed for them to engage in these tools and that's a tougher one that it would be cool to discuss more um, because the the languages needed that you need to master to be able to access all of this toolkit maybe uh, you know people might not have the time to learn them um, I feel like that's a big part of how you come to like the machinery is uh, having the time and the ability to, to learn those languages Anyway, just some quick reaction. Thank you. Uh, we'll take one last question, a, a really exciting one, uh, probably for all of you. Uh, is there a holy grail for machine learning interpretability? If you could get anything out of a neural network, what information ideally would be most helpful? So I'm going to give two answers to that one. And then if Emma wants to answer, so it says, says Amy, Emma. Um, I, the first is that my really big holy grail for using this is an AI answer and including interpretability is that I want to see AI really make humanity more resilient to the climate as the climate is changing. So I want to see our interpretability create be able to use to create methods that people trust and that are used that will really improve humanity's long term future. That's a really big holy grail. Slightly smaller holy grail. <laughs> um, I would like to see us make completely new science, like something that just we look at it, we have a prediction, and we say, "Wow, I never thought of it that way." But now we can really change our prediction. So, for example, tornado prediction. We're not going to control the tornadoes, but since they installed the Doppler weather radars, the you know the 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 um, CSI, all the skill ratings went up for tornado prediction. But now they've pretty much stalled because they just have so much sensing system, but could we use AI to somehow find something that's hidden that we could dramatically improve our answer? And I would do that through interpretability in the sense that I would want the interpretability to say here on all this data, here's this key thing that you weren't looking at before, and now they can go and find it and use it to improve the predictions. Emma's turn. All right. I had to think about this for a while. So I told Amy, go first, because I have to think. I mean, I now I have a magic wand. I can get anything. So I better think about what I wish for. So I'm thinking I would love to have a neural network visualization tool that kind of gives me an exhaustive list of all the strategies. You know, I told you before with LRP, we found these three different strategies. It doesn't, you know, th there might be more. And I don't know. How do I find them? So if there was a way to somehow come up with an exhaustive list of strategies, that would be amazing. And it kind of goes back to research back in the 80s for rule extraction from neural networks. Believe it or not, there was rule extraction of neural networks in the 80s. Um, but pretty much they got if then rules and it didn't really work. And then you can formulate it as a probabilistic model and you come up with a Bayesian network, but that's not that great either. So I don't really know how we would express this, but that would be my wish is that when I extract those strategies, that somehow I can figure out that I kind of got the most important ones, all of them, because then I can actually predict what happens if I feed in a new sample that it hasn't seen before. But I'm not sure such a thing exists, but that would be my wish if I had a magic wand. Something gives me all the strategies, not just some. Cool, I guess I should throw my two cents in here too. So like, since I don't know almost anything about actual interpretable techniques, I can just wave my hands and speculate beyond my pay grade. But as a climate modeler, I used to think that the only way to be causally unambiguous about relationships in our crazy nonlinear atmosphere is to do these hand of God experiments where you artificially manipulate a process. And, you know, I hear rumors that there are mechanisms of formal cause, you know, causal inference that can be done. And that's a form of interpretable machine learning that could be applied without any climate model in the loop to the observed record. And that seems like a holy grail to me if we could bypass all of our uh, imperfect numerics and poor assumptions about how clouds work to get more out of the actual observed record or single realizations of climate models than we realize. As in terms of the stuff I am qualified to talk about in terms of neural networks, if I could get anything out of a neural network for climate simulation itself, it would just be like a 
a really bulletproof emulation of, of three-dimensional LES physics interacting with every basic state I can think of. And if that, if that passed like minor extrapolation tests, that would be so exciting because we could run it on big GPU systems and TPU systems and just explore unimaginable limits of uh, cloud resolving climate simulation that I thought we'd have to wait two or three decades for. It may not work out, instability might kill us, but uh, it's really interesting times. <laughs> And, and I will just throw in, Mike, you keep on saying, you know, doing realization methods. You are, you just don't call it this way. All of your Jacobian matrices and all of the other things, you are doing realization methods. Okay, thanks. I'm not doing <laughs> LRP yet. We need to. <laughs> that, that was a really great question to end on. And thank you all for your thoughts. Uh, I think uh, at this point, I, I want to thank you all once again for an excellent set of lectures and, and great questions and discussion. Uh, and I think I'll pivot over to David. Uh, he might have a few announcements as well.